is a good question. Let me know if any of those other things come up too. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second science education seminar of this month. Yes, we will be very active. So Scott really despite some bad luck in the, in the past to travel from the west coast to the east coast, but he made it here safely. Uh, Scott is a professor of physics for all the Claremont colleges. He's going to explain us in details how many they are, where they are, because I have no clue, so I'm looking forward to the explanation. But he's originally from Vermont. He did his undergrad at uh, Winterboy College, and then he moved to California for his PhD at UCSB, and fortunately for him, he got to remain on that side of the continent. Um, so we're all interested in hearing about these days, because uh, we might be interested in applying right here. The same. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming this afternoon. My understanding <coughs> is that uh, this is going to be a little challenging with the, the uh, but it is what it is. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're here. I mean, the fact that you're here, and what it tells me is people in this room really value what I value, which is the undergraduate education. Now, you I mean apply this to sort of graduate school? <coughs> Essentially, the students are the focus, and it tells me that you folks recognize that. That is a focus, a major focus. It might be your primary focus, but at least it's enough more than you're filling out a CV and makes yourself look good because it says, you know, so and so at Yale University. So that I, I really appreciate that. So that's my philosophy coming in here is to talk about methods that we were using to try to get students to think about science differently. Well, actually, this is some bunch of perspectives. Why don't I just get started? So first of all, my name is Scott Gould, and everything about this page is already weird. Nobody understands what base, how to pronounce it, so I'm glad it, it is an interdisciplinary uh, program, because if it weren't, it would be a worse name. Okay, obviously my uh, first name is wrong. What does all this mean? WM Keck Science Department. I am the science program, the IM. This is the science program for three colleges simultaneously, Clamont McKenna, Pitzer and Scripps, and these are the three colleges of the Claremont colleges, the three that nobody remembers, the other two that everybody remembers are Hardy Mudd and Pomona. If you don't know Tom, Pomona, Thomas Pollard will really tell you all about Pomona. It's totally, it a nice conversation about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, to quickly sort of show you where is this, okay, this is Los Angeles, and it's the star over here. Okay, we're about 50 kilometers, 35 miles from Los Angeles. Okay, so we don't get ocean view property. Um, there is the picture of the college. And again, the star in the middle is where we are. Literally, there is Hermie Mudd. There is Pomona. Okay, uh, Scripps, uh, Pitzer, Clement, Clement McKenna College. And we are at the intersection, so we serve the three colleges. None of these three colleges ever had science as a the, uh, dominant discipline. In fact, the way the Clermont colleges were established was to essentially follow the Oxford model back in the 1800s, where they would establish colleges and focus only on particular uh, issues. So, for example, Scripps College, uh, which was done, uh, which was the women's college, uh, was uh, primarily a humanities course uh, disciplines. Uh, Pomona actually started this, and they would say, oh, it's because we value humanities, but the reality is they were getting twice as many qualified applicants from women to go to Pomona than they were from men. So what they did is they basically established the sister school over here, uh, and then they stacked the trustees so that this school could never have as much money as Pomona colleges. <laughs> and eventually what happened is it was established in the 20s, uh, in the 40s, uh, I'm sorry, in the 50s, the Sputnik, Harvey Mudd was established um, uh, in the 40s. Clement and Ken was established, which used to become Men's College. Uh, these were GIs coming back from the uh, uh, war. In fact, while the dorms look like dorms from GI from GIs. And the Pitzer College was the sociology college, and that was established in the hippie days of the 60s. So that's, and there's actually two graduate schools. There's one over here, uh, the Carmel Graduate University. KGI, the Tech Graduate Institute of Applied Life Sciences. So that's where we are, and this is the building in which I work in. Okay, know that. 
What is ACE? So the first thing I just simply want you to recognize is ACE is introductory biology, chemistry, and physics in an integrated format. This is actually our classroom. You notice essentially all our tables are on hold four. Um, it is a small environment. Okay. Here's the other thing you should probably know. Well, maybe you'll see what's happening here. Okay. So let me just get a quick sense of who, who am I seeing here. I see an undergraduate. Any other undergraduates here? No. Okay. Any graduate students? Okay. How about, let me ask this. Who would consider themselves working in the physics program? Oh, most of the people. Uh, math? Any biologists? A couple of, uh, okay. And, okay, so this explains why they said make it somewhat general. Okay, Okay, that explains. All right, I needed to remind myself. Okay, so why would we have an integrated science program? Well, clearly, since the um, early 2000s, the biologists have been talking about FIO 2010, pushing for more interdisciplinary and integrative science courses. This is from Associate of American Medical Colleges, HHMI. Uh, this is from the National Research Council. Again, an integration of biology of physicists, chemists, computer scientists, engineers, mathematicians. It's necessary in order to solve the challenging um, biological problem <coughs> uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, more quantitative aspects, more integration is required. We want to see it at the introductory level, as opposed to the silo effect, which is what happens at most colleges. Okay. Well, this is all fine and dandy. The reality is that's not why we established it. The reason we established it is because no high school student, or very few, ever thought about our science, our colleges, as something for the sciences. So we wanted to essentially raise our awareness of our colleges. Okay? Almost all of our students were life science majors. Okay? Biology, maybe biochemistry, but primarily or uh, other sort of biology with humanities biology and sociology. Um, we noticed that our students were not getting as many research experience. We recognized early on that that was something that was going to be necessary for them to go to graduate school or even medical school. Okay? And basically, we wanted to make sure the students had more opportunities to do more science courses. Uh, quick, some data here on motivation. This is the percentage of students entering indicating they had interest in science 2004. These are our colleges, about 14%. Most of our peer colleges at this time were 20%. Okay, and this is actually a lie. They, a lot of them recognized that at the time, if they were to indicate science, it was actually easier to get into the colleges than because we didn't have enough science students. So they actually, we never, I don't think we ever got to 14% back in the year. Now, of course, most of the students, okay, about anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of the students major in one of the three classics, the physics, biology, and chemistry. So we were in, in on, on the ballpark. Okay. So one of the goals of ACES is certainly it. As I point out, certainly we wanted to attract students, particularly students who might be interested in the physical science, make them aware of the physics. Because none of the students would actually take physics their junior or senior year and say, hey, I finally understand where that equation that seemed to come down from the tablet off the mountain came from in my intro bio textbook, okay, or maybe my intro chemo, okay? We thought it was by increased retention. Turns out we don't have a problem with retention, okay? Then we actually generally graduate more students than actually had shown interest uh, uh, than basically started our intro courses. Uh, we wanted to certainly raise the profile, uh, or in comparison to other colleagues. We certainly wanted to raise the profile of our program. Obviously, the pedagogical things were all about we wanted broad, integrated, understanding of nature. We certainly wanted them to be aware of uh, that research straddles multiple disciplines. If you're going to try to solve the problem of how do we create artificial eyesight, this draws from all the disciplines physics and chemistry and biology and you know, computer science and engineering and mathematics. Um, it had some other benefits. This allowed to we accelerate the introductory sequence. They can take more additional electives. They can go and study abroad. Our colleges are small and large colleges, so they value study abroad experience. Usually they go, we say, go have a culture experience. Don't try to take science courses when you're abroad. Value, take advantage of what is there. Okay? And of course, more R R E U opportunities. Um, all these pictures show students together. Very important for us. Thanks,
And the big deal is we had to target first year students because what we were going to do is ram a bunch of content down their throats and first year students are more gullible than seniors are not, right? I don't know about you, but actually first year students are telling me that, uh, uh, seniors are actually telling me that um, they made sure that their schedule their senior year was they only met on Mondays and Tuesdays. Now that was predominantly the students who were not in the sciences, but um, that is certainly the case. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Again, whole year of intro bio, intro chem, intro physics each. It's a year-long double course with semi-integrated double lab. Okay, it is a few number of students, 28 to 32. Um, we are basically targeting what we assume to be life science majors. There, we are hoping, we assume, a lot of them do go on to get MDs. Uh, uh, Dr. Whitney Messons, uh, PhDs. Okay, what we actually don't have a big. What fraction of all your students are the 28 to 32? I'm sorry, what? What fraction of all your students is that? Oh, uh, so at the time we were graduating, up to, again, this is all the sciences, physics, and chemistry, and we actually support now 15 different majors. At the time, I would say this is almost 40% of the majors. And of all the undergraduates that you could possibly serve? Well, the key is, since it's accelerated, we need to make sure that the students who are getting in, were, so this is an honors-based course, so we couldn't serve everybody. There were physical limitations. You start adding more students in, you have to add more facilities. This, this was a pilot program that has just taken off. Uh, but at the time, this would represent me, uh, no, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This would represent, say, 40% of the students who eventually graduate. Since we're assuming that most students out of this would be in the majors, in most schools, it's you know, we're anywhere between 50 and 60%, maybe some of the schools are actually 40%. Uh, we're just assuming that's why we chose that number. But there, there are limitations. And that's the key, is we require um, application. Most of it, almost all the students who apply, uh, all the students that we see have calculus. And I think all the students who come to Yale have at least a year of calculus. If they're going to be in the sciences, I don't know if that's true, if they're going to be in the humanities or something. I mean, the students just can't get into our colleges without this. And actually, did I answer your question? Um, no, probably I'll not. Talk to you later. Okay. Um, did you, I was going to assume you were going to ask the question, what percentage of the students are uh, pre-med? No, that's not pre -med. Is it like you've got about 300 incoming first years? Ah, so that's the question you want to ask. Yeah. So we have about 3,000 students over the school, so you're talking about 700 and oh, 800 students coming in, something like that. Of that, what percentage would show an interest in science? Maybe 10 to 20 percent, so that's what, 80 to 160. So this was a very non-traditional route. I will tell you, the punchline here is this is what we shot for. The first couple years, we could barely fill the course. At its peak, we were actually getting more applicants into this program than we were graduating seniors. It becomes sort of the thing, and the, the colleges, and getting, basically getting the the colleges were selling this. The students were showing up. We actually have to run another. We have a sister program called Integrated Biological Chemistry, okay, and that takes off some of these. So most students now are going through one of the two integrated programs. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? Three hundred. So I figured, eh, uh, no, there were not 300. There's probably 120, 140 students now who would be eligible to apply for this. Am I reading your last bullet correctly that you require more dimension of calculus coming into this? No, one? no, this is where we're going to actually, because we require some calculus, we actually can actually put in calculus, differential equations, some multivariate calculus, and how much do uh, but the key here is programming, and as Simon said, this is one of the reasons why he thought this was worth looking at. Is that a fair statement? Well, I think. Okay, here's the punchline that usually throws everybody out of the room. 
faculty members, other three disciplines are present at all times. When I've given talks about this in the past, uh, this is usually what causes the most problem. Having it small is okay, okay? Having, you say, advanced students is okay. Getting three faculty members to sit in, in, with the other colleagues for, for okay, 14 hours a day. Uh, 14 hours a week. <laughs> it just seems like 14 hours a day. It eats you alive. This thing is just, okay. So there we go. That's the structural in between. We meet every morning between two and three hours. We've reduced it to two now. We actually have moved the a lab time to a separate time, uh, primarily because it takes time to, for chemistry and biology experiments to get set up, developing the agents, stuff like that. I, as a physicist, generally put my uh, experiments inside the talk so that we get to electronics. I say, stop, let's pull the equipment out, let's start doing our electronics experiments. Uh, as I said, there are four switches. Okay, so that's the key, is it's six credits internally got in four. For those of students who are pre-meds, we just tell them we're going to write a letter saying, since I've told that a lot of pre-med students here in the sciences, uh, we tell them that this course is equivalent to taking intro, intro chem and intro physics, and that they are to do one year of advanced biology as their one year of biology since they were Okay. And this is where the key is, what do we do in terms of common fundamentals, what do we focus on, what's the structure, okay? So let me do a quick thing and sort of ask, ask the following. There are two forms of integration we saw, okay? Uh, certainly the first one is the classic sort of serial, the one that disciplines built at the time, built on foundations of the other. This certainly comes up in the case of doing something like, well, let's start with the fundamental properties of the universe. So we have these quarks, and these quarks enter inside of a proton. The proton interacts with an electron. These electrons go around they, in this sort of cartoonish version. Okay, this allows us to develop matter. And of course, these charged particles, whatever charge means, they interact. There, there are forces between them. There's matter in interactions. Okay, all you physicists, this is my favorite book, Matter and Interactions, Chabay and Sherwood. Okay. Uh, he was actually, he worked with Feynman. It's, to me, I would say, it is taking Feynman's lectures and reducing it to a level that usually undergraduate physics, physics majors can understand. Okay. Well, of course, that allows us to build structure, and now you have chemists putting them all together in some sort of crystalline format, or maybe some sort of gas format. Okay, and of course, once you actually have the atoms and the structure, you can start putting the structure together, and you can start building proteins and lipids and cells. All right, let me give you actually a demonstration now of how it works. I need four people who are willing to stand up and come up front. Okay, just, just come on up to the zone. Are you willing to stand up? So I need four volunteers. One, two, three. Let's do an AC. Please. <laughs> um, all right, so what I'll do is run it. Uh, you two move over there. Actually, what's your name? Your name is? Yeah, I'm just wearing it. Stacy. Okay, Stacy, come on. Actually, why don't you come over here? Okay. Okay, so how would you describe it? And we're going to push you over to the right. I apologize. Okay, how would you describe this scenario? This, this system. We have three people here and one person there. Okay. This is our state of three and one. Okay? Would you like to switch with this person? Switch. Okay. Now what would you describe the state? Three on the left and one on the right. Or I'm sorry, in your case, three on the right and one on the left. Okay? All right. So it's the same scenario. It's exactly the same. No, why not? Yeah, you can identify who these people are. In fact, you notice how many different ways could I get three people on the right and one person on the left? How many different ways could I get that to work? Oh, said one, two, three, 
more, right? So essentially, I'm already developing the idea of multiplicity or microstates. The macrostate is there are three on the right, on the left, and the microstate essentially is that there are four different ways to count that. Okay, in this case, it's because they're all there. Okay, we're gonna steal that. What? We're gonna steal <laughs> Oh, well, this, this is pretty standard. I mean, um, so. Already, we've got a sense of the fact that counting is going to be important. This is right from the beginning. All right. Already, I'm establishing by my, um, multiplicity the concept of entropy, the number of different ways I can be in a particular macro statement of three and one. Okay. You know, let me ask this way. Could you move back over there now? With the okay. Just notice, is this the same macro state as in? No, this is two and two. How many different ways are there to establish two and two? It's good that Simon's in the back. Can you count the number of ways? We're just counting, folks. Do you need any more time than someone else like to volunteer? So oh, I hear six. Yes, there's six different ways. Okay? So notice already the sense of that. This entropic state is more likely than having three and one. Okay? So let me try the following. Please move back over here. I'm sorry, you said to isolate you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so let me ask the following question. So again, we're sensing this concept of entropy as essentially the number of it. So I can ask the following questions. Which is more likely? If I'm going to move one person, either from this way to that way, or from that way to that way, which new state is more likely going from 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, or 3, 1, 2, 4, 0, because I could move her Which is more likely, the 2, 2 state or the 4, 0? This is a little harder to think about it. Because how many ways, how could I get to a 2, 2 state? How many ways? No. How many ways from this scenario? So we're now at this state. How many ways could I get to a two-two state? I can move only one person. Three. I can move you, or I can move you, or I can move you. Okay. How many ways could I get to a four-zero state? Just one. Okay. So given the fact that each of these people are just randomly going to be the person that chooses to move. Okay, or is it selected just by okay, which is more likely? We're going to go to a state with fewer, uh, a macro state of fewer microstates, or a state for which there are more microstates? We go to a state for which there are more microstates. Going you to 2 2 is three times more likely than the other way around. Okay? Already, I've established the concept of basically behind entropy. I've established essentially counting multiplicity. I've established already the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy tends to increase. And so the students don't walk out of this course. And so from that, you can start working with genetics because it's just counting states. You can do this obviously with situations where eventually you have gazillions of molecules and now you can do thermodynamics and we're off to the races. So we're just by doing this counting. By the way, I do this with all the diffusion and everything else like that. Thank you very much. You can have a seat. Okay? Ah, okay. Um, I actually wanted to do another, well, maybe we'll do a later. Okay? So, building on that, my biologists and chemist friends are off to the races, and then now they can put the terminology in, and the students can return to this concept. But what I am doing is looking at the number of possible outcomes. Or the number of possible states. And that's what essentially genetics is. So, okay. But there's another form of integration, and this is certainly the integration that I think I have the most fun of, and that is essentially is looking at parallel integration. You actually probably do this in the sense of, well, you do with springs, okay? And you do with waves. And the reason the springs create the waves is eventually there is a some sort of system that brings the, the uh, disruption back into equilibrium. Okay, well, homeostasis. Okay. I take 
E2 too much sugar, so what happens? There is insulin generated, okay, and essentially wants to bring my sugar count down, okay. Uh, the same sort of thing, I get, I run around and I exercise and I start to perspire. So therefore, I sweat, which is, tries to, that system is going to reduce my temperature back down to some core temperature. All these are examples of, how about another, the shot lace principle, we have chemistry here. Okay, how about this, a mass on a spring, I pull the mass down, it comes back to equilibrium, because what's the phrase that we're doing that's always in these, a type of feedback, a negative feedback system. Whatever we're out of, it comes back to equilibrium. Okay? So these are types of things that are shared. Since we have a lot of physicists here, this will be kind of fun. Okay, I want you to name that system. Okay, this is what comes up in, towards the end when we're doing a little bit of dynamics. Difference equations. Okay, this is a rate equation. Anyone recognize this rate equation? The number of our system, how it changes with time, is proportional to the number we have in the system. What are we going to get here? Okay. We start with a number, okay, we got five, we got five. Oh, this is a positive rate of increase. What happens to that over time? I got five, I get to add a few more, okay, now I get seven. Now what happens to my rate? It's now actually steeper because now I've got seven, and so the rate at which the number is changing is increasing with time. And it's going to go up and up and up, and it goes up exponentially. Okay? All right? Well, guess what? That is the first thing you start when you talk about population ecology. Anyone recognize that one? I was hoping there'd be some biologists here. What's this one? Anyone know? What? Yeah, the logistic, right, exactly. What is K? It's called the carrying capacity. It sort of limits to how much it does. Okay? This leads to this. Okay? How about this one? Right, and chemists here. Notice I even wrote it in the correct format. Yes, what's that? Michaelis Menten must be. Michaelis Menten, okay? Again, it looks scary, but the way I would teach it is the rate at which something happens has to be due to something in our system. Okay, same here. The whole point of this exercise is to start looking at what is in your system and what is affecting in which the rate they're changing with time. Okay, let's try another one. I saw a neuroscientist, they, they wouldn't recognize that one. What? You know this one? What? Hodgkin Huxley. Hodgkin Huxley. Exactly. All right? And this one, I'm sure you, I don't know, this one's an obscure one. Yeah. Okay. Forces, forces cause, they're changing the world. Okay? They're all the same. The process is, I want to identify the system, and I want to see how it is changing with time. So what we do is we actually teach them to generate differential equations, rate equations, and when we go through the process of forcing them to think about their system as a function of time, what are the properties, what, are, what am I actually looking at? Okay, so this is actually the mathematics. Okay, what's causing this? And even if you're not a mathematician, you ignore the blue part, there's nothing, this is good science. If you want to study a system, you got to know what's here. That's, that's our thinking in this process, okay? We got to figure out, okay, where are the connections? How is this being accomplished? What's the rates, okay? Let's try another one. We need to say, okay, this is certainly, almost all our systems are uh, discrete, uh, I'm sorry, uh, oh shoot, uh, yeah, discrete, uh, and actually we then actually make it uh, continuous. All our systems are certainly uh, not probabilistic, they're deterministic, okay? So we need some initial state of the system. Uh, it allows us to essentially do some chaos theory and they see how initial states really can vary the outcome, okay? We need to essentially get some measurements. This is why we do science, we collect measurements. 
We eventually do some calculations. We let the computer do all the math. Okay, this is in first year, in this first year course. And eventually, of course, the goal of almost all scientists is to make a graph. So there we go. This is basically the last quarter of the entire course. And all we do is we substitute in a different system. Population ecology? Fine. Chemical kinetics? Fine. Okay. Enzyme kinetics? F equals MA. Okay. So I teach them to essentially program a little bit. Um, we use uh, Maple mostly because it's not because it's the most popular, but basically they write out the equations as they would see them in the text. And it has the lowest activation barrier. Somehow by writing it, there is an enzyme that is basically getting through the barrier that allows me to get them. And they do all the numerical differential equations. I don't teach them on or anything like that. And allows them to plot pretty quickly. And again, they're able to make this system. Anyone, I got two entities in our system that are changing with time. Okay, A, you know, A is this one, and B is this one. You might recognize this system. Okay, so as when B goes up, then A goes up, but then B goes down, so then A goes down. This is biology. This is pairs and links. This is essentially, uh, a, essentially a predator prey type model. And then we can start to do things like three level predator. Okay? And this is again all at our introductory level. Um, of course then we compare it with actual data which at one point shows during one year that actually the rabbits were eating the cats instead of the cats were eating the rabbits. Um, this allows us to, to think about things in terms of particularly phase plots. How, uh, depending upon my initial conditions, right, I'm going to have a situation where A will vary this way while B varies this way. Pairs will change, okay, links will change. The problem is, what if we kill off half the links? Let's say you want to keep the hairs. Well, the problem is that it starts to change the system. Then what happens is suddenly the rabbits take off. But then there's now enough hairs, enough cats, enough links, to start eating the rabbits, okay? And suddenly the whole, all the populations will crash. And this is a common thing that comes up in evolutionary biology. Um, you know, cutting off one of the predators or cutting off one of the preys often leads to population crashes, and you end up killing both populations when you go for it. So this, these are examples of where we do parallel integration and again, these types of questions. Any questions at this point? Am I going fast enough? Um, again, if we have, so uh, it's interesting. Uh, do you guys play human zombies here? No? Okay, so this is the thing that we actually do. We have, we start literally with a couple zombies and when zombies touch humans, those humans become zombies. And it's across actually campus. Across, this is across campus. What? This is across campus. Across the whole campus. In fact, all five campuses. There are certain <laughs> safe places, like they can't do it in the dorms. Okay. Towards the end, you get hordes of zombies running after the one human. Okay. Um, sure, we can model these types of situations early on. They get a sense they recognize relative. We can look at tritropic systems, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, infectious diseases. This one actually I like a lot. I can give them a problem involving uh, disease. Again, this is a lot of the stuff that Simon does. Uh, and I'll tell you, this is fun because I can give them this problem early on and say, you have this infectious disease. It certainly is affecting these people at certain rates. Okay, at some rate they're going to recover. At what time? Okay, or essentially they may die, they never recover. Uh, when do we worry about, when do we know this is an epidemic? And they have no idea how to do this, but by teaching these processes, I can just hand them exactly the same problem, boom, they solve it. In fact, they love this problem because it makes them feel they have accomplished a real world problem, thinking about epidemics. Okay, So essentially all circuits are that way. All right, let's get to the meat. 
The course is completely out of order. This is generally the first semester. This is generally the second semester. You see F equals MA here? This is, where's the F equals MA? Entropy? Oh, I do forces. Ah, but they're all statics. Fields, electrostatic. Right there. Okay, Dynamics. Second half of the second semester, we finally do F equals MA. Why? Because our view was this gets the people started. Okay, this is the easiest to talk about. We do this since we have a lot of physicists. I will do it this way. Okay, this is the easiest to talk about. Describe the state. So this is for you physicists. Okay, describe the energy change of the state. And dynamics is the hardest because it's a continuous change of state. So why why do we put this up front? in our introductory courses. We have taken some of these ideas and put it on our other physics courses, but we have to be careful because some of the students say they want to take the first half of the physics at some other location, and that's not going to match up. So in a sense, when the students are in this, they essentially have to buy into this for the whole year. We've had students stop at the first half, we've worked it out, but as you see, this is the physics, and it, uh, I start with chapter 12. Way. Okay, what works well? Connections, lots of connections. That's what you push on. We write exams, okay? I, we actually do everything in Google Docs. The biologist generally writes her stuff. I will read her stuff or the chemist stuff. I'll read what they do, and I will write physics questions to relate to it, so to quantitative. Okay? Big thing is students always say, oh, that's why that equation is in the textbook. Oh, that's why it falls this way. Okay. This is a big issue. Someone halfway through all the class, the students say, everything I learned in high school science was a lie. Okay. And we do find that there is an increased interest in undergraduate research. Okay? There is unbelievable cohort building the students want to be together. Okay, here's a classic example. She graduated, or she finished these two years ago, she finished these last year. They, this is a student support group for all the students who are currently in these. They designed it. We didn't do it. This day. Students developed their own support uh, mentoring group. Okay? We actually have to explain to them in the end that when they get to other upper division courses, they will not see the big picture. They've gotten used to, okay, well, if this chemical reaction is occurring, what's the cause for that chemical reaction? And the answer is it won't be in the textbook, and sometimes it won't even be with the instructor. So you have to be a little careful. All right. And this is a, one thing that we didn't recognize but came out later, is again, by having different faculty members participate in it, they became more aware of the other person's, other disciplines' intro courses, that is affected. I teach upper division physics now differently because of more of my understanding of what's important or what is valued in chemistry and education. Boy, there are lots of challenges. We have no textbook. So we actually, in fact, in my ways, it's maybe not bad because we actually have three textbooks. The students still have to speak the language of that discipline. And by and large, in our society, they are still siloed apart. So they have to still be able to read the textbook of that particular discipline. We can help guide them through it. Um, boy, choose the topics. This is another one. You're accelerated. You can't do everything. This is a criticism. They don't see it in the intro, they'll never see it. So to which we often reply, uh, if, they never, if, if they never see it outside of the intro, is this principle, is this idea, is this knowledge that important? If you never use it later again, what's the value of it? And that's what we try to do. It sometimes it goes over well, sometimes it doesn't. Do we do top down, bottom up? Do we study a biological system and then build, try to figure out where are we going? Okay. Uh, languages and symbols. Okay. That's a big deal. We'll, I'll talk about this. Differences in philosophy. What is the role of the lab? This is a big issue that has come up. And then actually, this one, and I'll show another example. Narrative, learned by the faculty, learned by the faculty, what I said, learned. Okay, 
this language and symbols, you physicists, right? This has, these two things have net positive charge, this has net negative charge, there's the direction of electric dipole moment P, right? No problem here, guess what, that's not what they learned the first day. When they see electric dipole moment, I dipole, they see it this way. The arrow points up. Why? Because you've got a cross down here, because that's where the plus is. And that's what's all the chemistry textbooks. So here I'm teaching this, and they see this, they go, it's weird. Okay? Okay, what is the symbol for the electric dipole moment? Oh, it's mu. Are you happy for the electric dipole moment? Symbol's mu. No, you're happy that that's the magnetic dipole. Moment. Students have to learn the languages. Okay? We got them, but that one's that one throws them, and we have to explain. Okay, when you answer this question, okay, show me that you recognize what's going on here. Um, this one comes up a lot. Um, the terminology used to describe biological systems is still fused with religious terms. The purpose of this proton protein is to. Does it have a purpose as is, as is God has given, granted its purpose? I am to raise my daughter. That is my purpose. Okay? I don't know. Nature solved this problem by. Nature never solves any problem. Nature, it's a natural process. The outcome happens to be at this state. It solved implies that there is some intelligence here. But this is the, they know that there's no intelligence, and yet we still use the terminology as if it is a guiding hand in evolution, and essentially random as plays a role. Okay? You and I are going to be able to understand that, but what happens is students aren't because they're not used to it. So they use the terminology, but they're not familiar. They don't know what it really means. Um, this one, you know, it gets to me. The electron wants to, or it doesn't want. Really? I didn't know the electron had any desire. You'll hear that all. In fact, you say, oh, it's easier to explain the concept if I anthropomorphize it, right? Okay? The charge wants to be over here. No, it doesn't want to be. It just happens to be the outcome. The problem with using that terminology is then students assume that there are other things that are going on which actually don't. And this actually leads to all sorts of things like, here's a classic word. Okay? The reason the electrons on the outer edge of and atom are less held onto the, or less attracted to the center is because of shielding. The inner electrons block the effect of the proton, or the nucleus, on the outer electron. Okay? You may be mature enough and recognize that really, you may say, okay, shielding is a way of talking about superposition, and then the net, net effect is that the repulsion by the inner electrons plus the attraction by the outer electrons gives you essentially a smaller force. But the problem is students will literally visualize a shield. So we have to be careful. This is the terminology that's used by chemists. Do the students walk out and literally view this as if there's a shield? Okay. This one's another one. Okay, Hydrophobic molecules repel by water. Hydrophobic means doesn't like water. Well, no. Non-polar molecules are still attracted to water. How do I can make it consistent with, I can show them mathematically through electrostatics that a, a non-polar molecule is attracted to a polar molecule, and yet they're told this. So again, learning the sophistication. This is language and symbols are really hard. Okay, let's try this one. Figures, physicists, okay, which figures are correct for the two peak state, n equals two, l equals one, the one on the left or the one on the right? Okay, when you teach quantum mechanics, you square the wave function, okay, n equals two, l equals one, this is the n equals zero, this is n equals, n equals one, n equals minus one, this is what you show in quantum mechanics, okay, these are the symbols. This is what they get in the chemistry textbook. And yet they argue that these symbols, these uh, wave functions, are, again, square. This probability density, so it's the square of the wave function. So 
even if you put in the, uh, uh, the DR chip. Okay, that's a big one. Here's another one that really came up. Boy, I'm moving slowly. Oops, I'm sorry, not that one. Okay, plant leaves are green. Why? This is the graph that tells us plant leaves are green. Okay, so here's the color. And we see amount of light absorbed. Oh, so this is absorbing a lot of the blue, a lot of this sort of thing, blah, 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 and certainly the red, meaning that green light is never absorbed. It is reflected as if it bounced off the plant like a ball. Now, are you happy with quantum electrodynamics saying that light on a surface is literally bounces off? Or do we say, or essentially, cofining is absorbed and then re-emitted. And this is the color that gets re -emitted. The green is the color that gets re-emitted. Okay, what is, when I say reflection, what do I physically mean? What is the mechanism? Most biochemists will say, okay, no, will actually say, literally the light bounces off. This is the stuff that gets bounced off. This stuff gets absorbed. As opposed to what I say, it is, it, all the light is absorbed, and the green light is the light that gets emitted. More challenges. This is majorly labor intensive, as you can guess. Who wants to sit there for 12 to 14 hours a week? Sometimes we can get it down to eight. Okay? All sorts of things with how do we integrate with the rest of the curriculum. Turns out this turned out not to be a problem. We thought this would be a problem. It's not. This is too elitist. We got three faculty members in there all the time, highly prepared students. And finally, hey, you actually want me to work with these people? All right. I was told they're supposed to be evidence-based. OK, interest in at sciences has doubled the number of students who have shown interest in applications, has doubled the number of matriculations they actually choose. OK, so we've doubled the double. So actually, we have now four times as many students as we were getting before. We were actually overwhelmed. We've literally gone to the presidents and said, turn off the tap, stop advertising. We can't hold it. The students that we do have are not getting enough output. Okay, students at uh, ACE do really well. I've already mentioned about most of them completed, 90% completed, 90% major in the sciences. Okay, our goal of making sure that more students are interested in the physical sciences definitely takes off. They got introduced to physics and essentially in chemistry and from a biological standpoint earlier on. Since 99% of them came in actually wanting to do ACE, thinking they did, got to do less physics and had to do less chemistry, okay? They tend to win more uh, external scholarships. They are the ones that are going to Stanford Medical School and graduate school. Students from the other don't go as much. Our Stanford to us is like the Yale. I was going to say the Harvard, but I can't say that. Right. Okay, for you physicists, okay, 20, 30% of these ACE students Students that hated physics coming in, that's why they're very good. They are actually continuing in some of our division. At one point, actually, we were getting most of our physics majors out of ACE. We used to graduate in, out of the 3,000 students, so I don't know, we used to graduate three to four, now we're 12 to 17. We're actually getting, we actually are, we have too many students in physics and bio, biological physics related, and most of our students are here, which is unheard of in the country. Now, one of the three colleges is it all women's college? No, it's women's college. Actually, there are men at the college. Um, but still, this is pretty much a matter. And a lot of them are really going into the quantitative computational stuff. All right, so, oh yeah, and then finally, if you want to see some real data, so they uh, they take third semester physics after out of base. They, on average, score about 85%. This is an error bar. Intro physics students tend to score 75%. The probability that this is randomly, this was a random effect, was 10 to the minus 6. So it is pretty likely that the ACE is having an impact on them. And the differences between the two groups is insane. In fact, I'm almost about to change that because the last group coming in out of intro physics had an average higher SAT scores than the students coming out of ACE. Yes? So you've talked a lot about the, the content and the integration of the content. Is there a difference in the pedagogy you know, 
for example, you mentioned the, this strong sense of community and a sense of a cohort. Uh, I've wondered if that carries into the classroom in terms of you know, the collaborative learning in, in ways that are perhaps different than in the traditional track, etc. So, so in other words, is it not just simply content integration, it's other kinds of factors that may be at play as well? That is, that is a fair question. Have I separated out? The answer is no. Our other traditional through the intro physics route is also very collaboratively based. There is uh, a fixed grading system so the students are not competing for grades. Um, we try the same sort of techniques like I just did this morning. We do also do an intro physics as well. Um, I think a lot of it, as you point out, really is uh, they are building more of a cohort here than they are here. Every, almost every week, they're all together. We're